We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. While the best way for questions to get to us is through the website, I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we have a question from the Tabletop Bellhop blog. Ralph asks, what's the best gateway area control game? Oh, thanks for the question, Ralph. Now, technically, we already answered this question, specifically Ralph's question, last week during our AMA. But after the show, and even partway during the show, I kept thinking of other great gateway area control games. Plus, I kept thinking in the back of my head, did Ralph actually want area control or area majority or both? So I actually thought it'd be worth returning to this question as a full topic and a full discussion. As with so many mechanics, there are subtle variations and differing uses of terms that can confuse and confound the ability to concisely answer some of these seemingly simple questions. Yeah, because Ralph asked about area control. Now, over the years, I've learned this could mean Ralph wants an area control game, exactly as he asked, or it might mean he wants an area majority game, or he might be interested in both. Now, we talked about the differences between area control and area majority way back in episode nine of the podcast, episode called Under the Hood. But I think it's worth bringing up again for those of you who haven't listened to the original. Absolutely. If you're new to the podcast, all of our back episodes are there for listening on your favorite podcatcher on YouTube, or you can go to tabletopbellhop.com and find the link to both the text and the audio as well. Now, area control game. In an area control game, you get points or a reward or something for controlling a section of the board or the map. Now, in these games, most of the time, only one player can have pieces on that thing, in that section or on that card or in that spot. Uh, and you can't have multiple people in an area. It's, I have it and no one else does. Now, the most well-known area control game has got to be Risk. Everyone knows Risk growing up. You can have two different people in North America. It's one person owns it, one person controls that area. But there are many out there. Uh, there are actually a ton of war games that are area control games, but there are quite a few board games as well. Yeah, Bellhop favorites like Shogun and Wallenstein are yeah. examples that we've talked about a number of times on this show. Yeah, fantastic games that would be on this list, but they are no way gateway games. <laughs> <laughs> now, Very on true. the other hand... Area majority games allow multiple people to have pieces in one spot, in one map section. And you're going to get points not only for having the most or most valuable things in the area, but you're also going to award points for second and third most or possibly fourth most, depending on the game. Uh, many games are just first, second. Some do first, second, third. It's The difference here is you have multiple forces vying for one spot at once. So you can have multiple units in an area. Now, the most pure area majority game and one that I always recommend to people who are curious about this type of game is El Grande. And uh, for a great, another great, great area majority, see if you can get your hands on Louis XIV. It's a little older, 2005, yeah. uh, but they have actually re-implemented it in uh, Zoomafia, which is huh. uh, a newer version. It, it's well rated, but I can't, uh, I can't say too much about it. It's still pretty new. Yeah, Louis, I played. I have not played Zoomafia. Louis is a nice one. No, I like I like the fact you brought up Louis as an example because it's not a folk on a map game. It's it's an abstract courts politics and but it's still area majority. It's a good example, though. Again, not a gateway game. <laughs> so since Ralph here isn't particularly clear on what he's looking for, or he's exactly clear and he really wants area control, but just in case he's not, he's looking for other types of area influence games. The following game suggestions are going to include both games, both types of games, both of these mechanics. So let's start off with two games we talked about during an AMA, just in case you missed last week's episode. So the first game that came to my mind when asked that question last week was an older Rio Grande game from 2002 called Clans. Now, this is a game where players are playing clans of people represented by different colored huts. You're vying for control of 12 different regions on a map. Uh, there's four different colors of each region, and each turn players are going to move all the huts from one area to another area until an area has more than seven huts in it. And then it's uh, the city's then founded and you can't touch it anymore. At the end of the round, two colors of terrain are going to score, and they score based on who has the most huts in each area. And then whoever has second most huts gets secondary scoring. 
Now, the neat bit in this game that makes it really cool is that no one knows which color everyone's playing. So there's some interesting bluffing going on in this game as well as area control or area majority. And just to, just to point out, there are a bunch of na- games that have the name Clams in them. Uh, recently, yeah. Clans of Caledonia has been a uh, has, has been a, a big uh, big game with some really high numbers. But this is just Clans Clan. from 2002. Um, so during our during our AMA, I pointed out this game is long out of print, but has been released with a new theme as Faye F A E from Zedman Games. Yeah, the thing with the uh, Faye, I have not played it. I, I personally haven't tried it, so I have no idea how it compares to the original game Clans. Right. Now, the other game I recommended after a bit of thinking, like I was like, Clans, there's got to be another one. As it finally clicked in, and that is Small Worlds. And still, for the rest of this episode, if you are just going to pick up one area control game that's a gateway game, go with Small World. Like, that's my number one recommendation. Normally, when I give these lists of 10 games or whatever, I don't rank them. But in this case, Small World, I really do think is the best choice. Because here, players are fighting for control of a world that is simply too small to fit everyone in it. Players start by picking a race and power combination and get chits to represent their units, which are used to spread out over the map. Now, to take over a map section, all you have to do is spend more chits, more tiles than are there already. If outnumbered, though, there is a push your luck mechanic where you can roll a die. So say I only have two chits and I want to take over Sean's area that has three, I can roll the die and hopefully roll a plus two on it to be able to take it. But if you do this chance, there's a chance you'll just lose your troops. At the end of every round, you're going to get one point per area control. Really simple scoring mechanism. Things get really interesting, though, because you're going to run out of chits. You're going to run out of troops. And then you do this thing where you put your race into decline. The next round, you start up with a whole new race and power combo and expand outward again. Yeah, and I really need to take the time to learn this. I sat down at the app on Monday. I've had it for a while. I've just never actually really played it. And I decided to jump in blind and play without doing the tutorial. That was a horrible mistake, it turns out. Uh, (laughs) But (laughs) Yeah, uh, it's not a hard game, but if you have no idea, you're just like, I don't know, what's all these different combos, and what do I do with this? I have 20 chits. What do I do with these 20 chits? Yeah, I can see. Like, you, you do need that brief explanation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was Small World, and the app uh, version of it is Small World 2, because I guess the first one was not successful. Yeah, they, they've launched the app, and it was a third-party app, and the, I don't know, there was licensing, and it wasn't very good, and then they relaunched a Small World 2. And to be honest, I don't own the physical game, so it's not behind me in this pile, because we just play on our iPad. We play it on a tablet. Right. I will admit, it's not great on the phone. It's a little small, but if you can get the app version, it is also on Steam. Yep. All right, up next, I've got Mission Red Planet. Now, this is specifically the second edition from Fantasy Flight Games. I did not play the original, so I don't know. I do know things changed. Uh, This is a Victorian-era rocket punk game in which you're heading to Mars to find and mine Solarium. Uh, This is some ore that can be combusted and produces 10,000 times more power than steam. I'm not sure why it has the Victorian steampunk thing, but whatever. Players pick a character card out of nine different choices, like engineers, and I, I don't even know the different card, but different character cards. You're going to play one of those. That determines where you're going to place your astronauts on a bunch of different ships that are leaving from Mars and give you a special ability. Ships once launched land on the planet, and then your people spread out to the spot they land on. Multiple times during the game, players get to mine the areas they control to score points. And again, it's it's a whoever has the most astronauts in this spot is the one that gets to do the mining. In addition, each player has a hidden goal. Uh, this is not only a great area majority game, but it's also a great gateway game or next step game. Uh, this one comes up very strongly recommended as a next step to ticket to ride. So not only are you looking at a great next step game, it's got your area control right there. Yeah, and a highly topical game right now is Mars is widely in the news between NASA and SpaceX. Uh, this today I said uh, I saw that they're looking, they're expecting that they will announce the discovery of life uh, of some form on Mars uh, by late 2021. So interesting. Yeah, I saw that Elon was sharing pictures of his rocket ship, the, the ship that's going to bring people to Mars. Oh. Yeah, well, that that's a whole. Yeah. I prefer the <laughs> the scientists at NASA giving us actual information. <laughs> But I, you know what? I do encourage his uh, exploration of science. So there you we'll go. leave it at that. And that was Mission Red Planet. All right. Something with a very different theme, World's Fair 1893. Now, this is a great example of an area majority game that is not about moving units on a map. 
Instead, you are playing pieces, those cubes, representing players sending supporters to various exhibits at the World's Fair. Now, this combines area majority with set collection, so players gain reputation for leading an area in the number of supporters there, as well as collecting the most midway tickets. And you also get points for the breadth and diversity of the exhibit cards you've collected through those supporters. Uh, what I really dig about this game is that all the exhibits are actual inventions and there's flavor text on each of the cards that gives you a bit of background on the different things. It's a neat way to tie the theme in with the game. Yeah, no, uh, that's a, a fun little game and it's uh, it's nice to have that little extra boost of the set collection in there as well. Always a nice thing. And to have it, uh, you know, familiar with uh, uh, other games and other aspects. Um, great. Uh, that was World's Fair 1893. All right. I don't know what it's going to be with today with games with dates in them, but that seems to be a thing. Uh, up next is New York 1901. In this game, players are building skyscrapers in downtown New York City. Skyscrapers are represented by polyominoes, at think Tetris, and are built into various districts on the board. They're bought via color-coded cards using a system that's going to be familiar to anyone who's played Ticket to Ride, where you're going to play the same sets of cards to put out your buildings. Uh, the area majority aspect comes down comes into play at the end of the game where players are going to get points for having the most most of their skyscrapers on each of the three raid roads. So whichever player has the most skyscrapers gets the points. What's neat here is that the corners are really powerful because that building will count for both streets. Right. So they're actually using that toll, the actual addressing of buildings and the, the funkiness that can happen in New York and others, other grid designed cities uh, as a function of the game, which is a nice little, uh, a nice little touch and uh, very thematic. So that was New York, 1901. All right, next is a Rainier Nizia classic that's been out since uh, at least 2000 or so. That is Samurai. Now, this does area control in a unique way. Players are putting numbered tiles on a hex grid attempting to surround cities. Now, these cities each contain one, two, or three different resources. Uh, there's like Buddha statues, there's high helmet troops, and rice, I think, are the three things. Once a city's surrounded, the player with the most points surrounding that city gets to take all the resources. Endgame scoring swaps the game from area control to area majority. Well, not really area majority, but a majority-based system, as players are going to then earn points for having a majority in each of the three resources. Now, while this came out way back 1998, it's still in print. You can still get it. Fantasy Flight's the new modern publisher. It doesn't look quite as good as my original version, in my opinion, but the gameplay is still just as good. Yeah, no, and it's uh, it's that right in that midweight uh, category out of two out of two five, uh, with you know half an hour to an hour play. Hard to go wrong. That was Samurai. All right, next is Risk Legacy. Yes, I am going to include a version of Risk on this list, a very good version of Risk, in my opinion. I was very skeptical when Risk Legacy came out, but a bunch of gamers I respect strongly recommended it, and you know what? They were right. Uh, besides being the first Legacy game and everything that grew out of that, including games like Gloomhaven we're playing every Friday, uh, Risk Legacy is a really good re-implementation of Risk. The big change is it's now victory point pace. The game ends when you get four victory points and you start the game with one because you get one for controlling your home base. So you really only need to get three more points. It's no longer about having to take over the whole map. And what this means is the games are generally short. I think the longest game we played was under two hours. And most times when we sat down and played Risk Legacy, we would play two games in one game night. To me, the whole legacy thing, which is really cool, is just an added bonus, an awesome added bonus. Yeah, no, uh, Risk Legacy's got a lot of love, even people who generally hate Risk uh, overall. I mean, Risk is Risk is one of those games that among gamers has sort of gone down into the Monopoly level of, of dislike. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, Risk Legacy is the, the good version. All right, here's one that, again, just kind of mixes things up, and that is Smash Up. Because this card game takes the area majority thing and makes it an abstract. Instead of battling over spots on a map, you're vying for control of location cards. Now, you're doing that with forces made up by smashing together two different decks of cards. So you get, for example, alien pirates battling against wizard zombies for control of the tar pits. Uh, each deck in this in Smash Up plays completely different, and there are a ridiculous number of combinations, especially after you add in the number of expansions that continue to come out for Smash Up over the years. 
Yeah, this one has uh, has definitely been well expanded. Uh, I see twelve versions, but and six expansions on there. And now uh, I guess that is that how many decks are coming out in each expansion? Like, is it? Um, I to be honest, I have not caught up on it myself. Right. I think it's usually four factions per expansion, but I'm not positive. Right. But that adds up. Uh, that adds up pretty fast. Um, and that was Smash Up. All right, another game with some numbers in it. 1812, The Invasion of Canada, or your choice, 1775 Rebellion. Now, personally, I think it's uh, 1812 is the way to go because of the theme. But that's Invasion of Canada, and I live in Windsor, and my home city's on the map, right? So there's obvious reasons I, I think that's a cooler game to play. It's more interesting. But I got to say, 1775 is rated higher on Board Game Geek, so maybe the better game. Now, both of these games are cube-based, card-driven war games, uh, but don't let that scare you away. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, war game, no, that's going to take hours to play, and I got to sit and do historical research and chits and look stuff up on charts. No, that's not what this is. Uh, 1775 has often been called by many people the ticket to ride of war games because these games from Academy Games are the most accessible war games on the market. If you want a gateway version of a traditional area control war game, this is the place to start. Yeah. Now, when you say that uh, 1775 has a higher rating than, than 1812, we're talking about yeah. very, very minor minor numbers here. Uh, it's a 7.7 7 to a 7.4. So both are yeah. well above 7, uh, and, and definitely I think it, it comes down to theme. I would not choose based on the, the rankings on BGG at that point. Yeah, my guess is that 1775 is probably just more popular by, with Americans, and that's the majority of the board game geek user base. Yeah. They do have others. Like, they, there's uh, 600 and something Vikings. I haven't tried that one yet. It's in my pile of shame. They, they, there are a lot of games in this series. Just the two highest rated were these two. And like I said, 1812 is great. Plays just as good with two players, up to five players. When you play five players, you play teams. Oh, great. Really solid game system. Yeah, they actually say two and five are the best for 1812. Yeah. To me, it's it's one or the other. You either play two player or you play yeah. with all five. All right, and that was both uh, from Academy Games, 1812, Invasion of Canada, and 1775, Rebellion. All right, this is the last one I got on the list. Uh, this one I haven't played. Uh, this is Royals. I haven't personally touched this game. I know very little about it, but I, um, every time I do one of these game recommendation episodes, I do some research, right? We're not, unlike the AMA, we're not just going off the top of my head here. Um, I do go online and I try to look at other people's lists, mainly to see if there's anything I missed or forgot about. And often there'll be something I'm like, oh man, yeah, I totally forgot about whatever. And I put it on my list. Well, this time I didn't forget about anything that I noticed, but every single list, everyone's list of great gateway games includes Royals. Great way area control game. So Royals seems to be the popular game that I have not tried. Um, I it, um, Players in this, in Royals, players take on the role of a great noble house in 17th century Europe and fight for control and influence in Europe. Uh, you play through three periods, and at the end of every period, points are awarded to players with the greatest influence, there's your area control, in each of the four countries. Like that... Sounds good. It's got a, a BGG weight of under 2.5, so it's in the in the right area there. Yeah. No, and, uh, and do be careful, because there are two games called Royals on uh, oh, out nice. there right now, and they're both re actually reasonably recent. So 2014 is the game we were talking about, and it looks like something that we would talk about on this, this show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 2013, on the other hand, is a micro card game that no, whose that's... box actually looks more like something you'd see in uh like head shop somewhere or something. I don't know. Wow. It's, okay. A, apparently it's still thematic. It's, it's still a King Regal thing, but yeah, it's right. a different, different game. So you want Royals from uh, a back to spiel or who else is uh, arcane wonders, I guess would be arcane the wonder. Uh, yeah. Arcane North wonders, American arcane wonders American. Royals. Uh, and and it, I should have grabbed a link for it. There is an awesome how to play video with people all dressed up. I, I, I can't remember which show did it, but it was really good. Yeah. I, I should have grabbed a link of that. If I think of it, I'll put it in the link to the show notes. It's it's a group that did an actual play of it, and they literally all wore costumes and everything for yeah. it. Like I said, it looks like an interesting game, but I haven't played it myself, but I wanted to put it on the list because everyone else seems to think this is your go-to. All right. Though I got to say, um, Mission Red Planet actually came up more recommended, but that was actually... Oddly enough, not everyone seemed to recommend Small World. So I think, again, that's that difference between area majority and area control. Area Small World is very much area control. You're not getting any points per second. Yep. 
You you own an area or you don't. And I thought that's more what Ralph was looking for. So that's why that state is my strongest recommendation. All right. And that was Royals from Arcane Wonders 2014. Uh, so that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more game, gaming, and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. We are all about answering your questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at table, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 